Having been a nurse for over a decade and primarily working in the CVICU, I can tell you pacemakers is one of my favorite rhythms. In this video, we're going to be talking about our ECG study guide, more specifically, pacemaker rhythms. Let's get started. So what are some common concepts or rules that we're going to need to know when it comes to pacemaker rhythms? Well, as we know, a pacer spike is going to occur before the waveform that it is pacing. So you can have one of two things occurring. You could have a pacer lead that's sitting up here in the atria, which would be causing a atrial pacing rhythm to occur, meaning we're going to see a pacer spike before our P wave. Or you can have a lead sitting down here in the ventricles, meaning that we're going to see a spike before our QRS complex. And that also tells us that we have ventricular pacing, of course, because it's sitting down here in the ventricle. Or you could have a dual pacemaker where you've got one lead sitting up here in the atria and you have another lead down here in the ventricle. That means you're going to see a spike before the P wave and the QRS complex, meaning that we have an atrial ventricular AV pacing. Because the electricity is coming from the pacemaker and it's not actually coming from the heart's own electrical conduction system, the waves, waveforms that you're going to see in your ECG may appear to be a little bit different. That's very common. The last thing I want to discuss is that pacer spikes do not mean we have mechanical capture. What exactly does that mean? Even though we are seeing electricity on our ECG, it doesn't mean that the heart's actually receiving the electricity. So while we see waveforms like we saw with PEA, it doesn't actually mean that the heart is actually contracting. So you really need to make sure that you're watching these individuals really carefully because they can go into asystole and we wouldn't even know it. So we're gonna start with atrial pacing. Atrial pacing is a rhythm that's characterized by a pacing spike that precedes each P wave indicating that we have an artificial pacemaker that's initiating the heart's atrial activity. In situations requiring atrial pacing, it means that the SA node typically does not function adequately, either due to there being an intrinsic node dysfunction, or there could even be extrinsic factors like medications, as well as underlying heart disease. The pacemaker takes over the role of the SA node by sending electrical impulses at preset intervals to stimulate the atrial contraction. So the pacemaker's lead is going to be placed up here in that right atrial wall. And when the device is triggered, that triggering is going to emit a small electrical charge that's going to depolarize or contract our atrial tissue. It's going to stimulate that natural pacemaking activity that we would see with the SA node. So what are some common indication as to why we would need atrial pacing? So one of the things could be sick sinus syndrome. This occurs when the SA node fails to generate impulses regularly at an appropriate rate. Wires can be placed with sinus bradycardia only in specific situations where the slow heart rate does not meet the body's circulatory demands. Some Atrial fibrillation with slow ventricular response may also require this. Usually we try to do it with medical management first to control the ventricular rate, but if all else fails, we can place a pacemaker. And then lastly, we have AV blocks. This is typically common whenever we're seeing any kind of heart blocks from taking place, particularly in cases where only atrial pacing is required and the AV conduction remains intact. Next up, we have ventricular pacing, and this is characterized by a spike that's going to be right before each QRS complex on our six second strip. A pacemaker lead is going to be surgically implanted into one of our ventricles. Typically, it's going to be the right ventricle, and when it is activated, again, it's going to emit that electrical impulse to depolarize the ventricular myocardium. This direct stimulation is going to cause the ventricles to contract and pump blood throughout the body without having to actually rely on the natural atrial contraction as well as the AV nodal transmissions. So what's key here is that as a result, the ventricular pacing is going to produce these wider QRS complexes than you would naturally see, reflecting that the unnatural spread is taking place due to the electrical activity coming from the actual pacemaker and not through the conduction systems like we see with the Purkinje fibers. So common indications when it comes to ventricular pacing can include a complete third degree heart block. This is so common, is if we cannot control that complete heart block, you're almost always going to see a pacemaker that's going to be placed. The big reason why we would see this is particularly because of the fact that the intrinsic rate of our ventricles is between 20 and 40 beats per minute. That's not enough for us to sustain life. So what they do is they place this pacer 
your lead down here in the ventricles at a preset determined rate so that it can continue to contract and beat and push that blood out to the body even though we're having an issue inside the conduction system of our heart. And we can also see a significant bilateral bundle branch block. In this particular case, we have this impairing of that natural electrical flow to our ventricles, just like we saw with our complete heart block. We can also see this with certain heart surgeries. If a heart surgery may affect the natural conduction pathways, we may have to place a pacemaker in order to help it retrieve its normal beat. And then lastly, we have cardiomyopathy and extensive heart disease. In both of these cases, we may see extensive electrical conduction issues, which would give us a reason to place this kind of pacemaker. And then we have atrial ventricular or AV pacing. And this is often referred to as dual chamber pacing because it involves the simultaneous and coordinated pacing of both our atria as well as our ventricles. So in this particular case, we are going to place one lead up here in the atrium and another lead down here in the ventricle. And when you're looking at an ECG, you're gonna see that you're gonna have a pacer spike before your P wave and another pacer spike before your QRS. The goal of this kind of pacing is to closely mimic the natural timing and sequence of the heart's electrical system, promoting a more efficient cardiac function. So what conditions would want to warrant a AV pacing type of pacemaker? Well, starting, we can see a significant AV block, more specifically a second degree type two or third degree block, where that electrical signals from the atria are gonna fail to reach our ventricles consistently every single time. We can even see a worsening sick sinus syndrome, more specifically a sick sinus syndrome with AV block, where both the sinus node and the AV node are going to be impaired. Heart failure that leads into an AV block is also a common reason for this pacemaker. Typically, patients with heart failure might benefit more from having a synchronized cardiac pacing due to the fact that they already have impaired cardiac output, and it also helps reduce a lot of the symptoms that they see. Other common causes can include fibrosis, ischemic damage, congenital defects, as well as degenerative changes associated with aging. So sometimes a pacemaker can malfunction and failure to capture and failure to pace are two significant complications associated with cardiac pacing. And it's really important for you to understand the differences because both of them come with their own risks. So starting with failure to capture, this occurs when the pacemaker emits an electrical impulse, but it's not sufficient enough to depolarize our myocardium, resulting in no corresponding contraction. So if we take a look at our strip, you can see here that we have a ventricular pace rhythm. We have a pacer spike before each QRS complex. But as you can see right here, we have a pacer spike with nothing behind it. It's like our QRS ghosted us. Essentially, what's happening here is the heart is not capturing the impulse. You can think of it as capture means no contraction or complex, or you can even think of it as being there's a problem with the heart. The pacemaker's working, we can see the spike, but the heart's not receiving the electricity. And then next up, we have failure to pace. And this happens when the pacemaker itself fails. It fails to emit that electrical impulse at that scheduled time or intermittently fails throughout all of those scheduled times to deliver those impulses. An easy way to remember this is no shock, no show, meaning that we're not gonna see a pacer spike here, right? We can look at our six second strip and see a pacer spike here with a QRS, pacer spike here with a QRS, and then just nothing here happened, right? So if we have no shock, we're not going to show anything on our ECG. You can also remember this as the problem lies with the pacemaker, right? It's literally in the name. Failure to pace. It's the pacemaker that's having the problem, not the heart. So it's important to know that with both of these different kinds of malfunctions is that they can be transient or they can be persistent. And there could be various factors that may be influencing them such as a lead being dislodged someplace in the heart, the battery in the pacemaker itself could be depleted, we could see electronic malfunction as well as programming errors. And then lastly, we have oversensing and undersensing. And these are two critical phenomena that are related to the performance of cardiac pacemakers, representing opposite problems with how the pacemaker detects cardiac and extracardiac signals. So oversensing occurs when the pacemaker mistakenly detects 
electrical signals as true cardiac events. So as you can see here, we have this artifact or all of this electrical noise that's taking place. It could be due to muscular activity or external interference, but it's thinking that this is true cardiac activity, which means it's not gonna send any pacemaker spike throughout this entire time because it doesn't want to overly pace the heart. And then we have the complete opposite of oversensing. We have undersensing. And undersensing happens when the pacemaker fails to detect actual cardiac events. And what I mean by that is it's the person's own intrinsic rate that's happening underneath the pacemaker's preset settings. This is going to result in unnecessary pacing that can lead to pacing during vulnerable periods of time in our cardiac cycle or it can have a failure to deliver pacing when it's truly needed. So as we can see from our six second strip, we've got a couple areas that are a little bit concerning, right? We have a pacer spike that was right before this QRS, almost in the QRS. And then we have another pacer spike that's in between our QRS and our T wave. These are both really vulnerable situations. So if we don't address this, this can actually lead to lethal rhythms. So a helpful mnemonic in order to remember both of these is overly cautious and under responsive. Overly cautious refers to oversensing, where the pacer sees too much and may halt pacing unnecessarily. And under-responsive refers to under-sensing, where the pacer doesn't even see enough and fails to respond appropriately. I hope that this video is helpful in understanding everything you're going to need to know when it comes to those pacemaker rhythms. As always, if you have any questions, make sure that you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Head over to nursechungstore.com where there's a ton of additional resources in order to help you ace those ECG concepts. And as always, I'm going to catch you in the next video. Bye!